Studies show that around 10 to 20% of people infected by the COVID virus may go on to develop symptoms that can be diagnosed as long COVID. What should you do if you think you're dealing with it? And what's the latest research telling us about long COVID? If we can get people more comfortable in accepting this condition and just treating the patient and their symptoms versus, oh, is it long COVID, is it not long COVID, is it not real or is it real or is it just in the brain? These people in the end, all they need is our help. Dr. Greg Vanishka Shorn is the director of Mayo Clinic's COVID Activity Rehabilitation Program. He's an international expert on helping those coping with COVID months and even years after their initial infection. It's a situation with big implications for our healthcare system. Because of what we see in long COVID, we think that pushing the body too hard, uh, and the too hard part is the key here, can actually make things worse. Because of long COVID and its inflammatory changes that we think underlie it, individuals with this condition, they don't have the normal uh, physical responses to activity and uh, exercise. And this is Conversations on Healthcare. Well, Dr. Van, if we may, uh, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. You know, you identified long COVID very early in the pandemic in your occupational medicine practice. Uh, we know COVID symptoms can create biological changes. Research led uh, by a scientist at the University of Helsinki suggests that genetics plays a role. But right now, there are no tests nor bio biomarkers to diagnose long COVID and unfortunately, no therapies to treat it. Uh, I'm wondering how, if you could describe for our audience a long COVID. Yeah, absolutely. You know, long COVID is a group of symptoms that occur after a COVID infection and lasts way longer than the normal recovery period. We're often talking weeks or months after a COVID infection. Now, the symptoms that we see primarily with this condition, the number one thing is fatigue. And it's a quite extraordinary fatigue. So for example, someone would report that they might do something as simple as take their dog out for a walk around the block or take out the trash. And then they can experience fatigue that sometimes lasts for hours or even days afterwards. It's quite disabling. The other symptoms that we commonly see are shortness of breath, headaches, as well as troubles with thinking, often referred to as brain fog. Well, Dr. Van, obviously, these are incredibly troubling for people. And I think uh, we've heard a lot about the, the changes in uh, long COVID over these years since the vaccines became available as the course of the pandemic moved on. Are you still seeing new patients who present with this kind of picture or has it modified over time uh, in the way that we have so many variants of COVID vaccine and the COVID uh, pathogen itself? Is long COVID also changing? You know, we actually have not seen much of a difference in how long COVID actually presents. I would say what we have noticed, though, overall, and this is good news, is that there has been a decreased frequency of the occurrence of long COVID. And we think this is primarily due to the different variants of the coronavirus out there. Of course, time will tell what's going to happen this fall with some of the new variants that are out there. But I'm hopeful that we won't see a massive increase in the number of cases. With that being said, even though the Omicron variant seems to have less cases of long COVID, we still have a steady stream of new patients that come in requesting help sometimes two or three months out after their infection in 2023. Hmm. Yeah, there's a study out right now in the journal uh, Nature Medicine that found long COVID symptoms create a greater burden of disability than heart disease or cancer. Are, are you seeing this in patients? And uh, what's your reaction to these findings? Hmm. I am seeing these in patients. Uh, my reaction is one of not surprise and uh, highlights the importance of tackling this condition and similar conditions in medicine. Uh, being an occupational medicine provider, one of the things that my group has been very focused on from the very beginning when we started working with these patients is how is their function actually doing and how are they doing with their work? There's a lot of focus on the symptoms out there and that makes sense. but those symptoms come down to affect a person's ability to live their life both at home and at work. Uh, at the time of presentation to our clinic, a little bit more than half of the individuals that we saw um, were able to work in some form. That sounds promising, but at the same time, the average time to presentation between someone's infection and a place like Mayo Clinic for care was about three months. 
So another way to look at that is three months out after an infection, only a little bit more than half of individuals are able to get back to work in some form. And some of our other studies out there too that have looked at the long-term effects of the long COVID uh, phenomenon on work, it was found that individuals seven months out after their infection, 72% went for, sorry, 72% uh, of individuals who were fully employed went down to 44%. Were you That's seeing any waning of symptoms 18 months out or we may not be that long? For the study, what 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 have you been identifying? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a lot of gloom and doom out there when it comes to long COVID, but we do see that people get better. Some people have permanent symptoms and they are still battling with those, but some people do get fully better. Sometimes around four to six months out, typically. But for individuals who are experiencing the long-term course of long COVID, what we have seen is the fatigue and the physical complaints, like muscle aches and shortness of breath. That does seem to get better most of the time fully, but really seems to be lingering or some of the cognitive effects like brain fog. Well, it's good news, uh, certainly, that uh, we think that the whether it's the changes in the variants or it's the vaccines that people have, that uh, it certainly reduces the risk. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Dr. Van, uh, this is not the first disease of our clinical lifetimes uh, to present with fatigue, uh, with muscle aches, with some cognitive disability. We're in the northeastern part of the United States. We've certainly lived through the advent of the Lyme uh, epidemic and all the sequela. When you see patients, is it is it usually very clear cut? And do you think in practice generally, not in specialist practices like Mayo may offer that people get a diagnosis correctly? Might we be missing other things? Do you have a protocol for what else should be looked at? Maybe share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, the, the problem with long COVID, or the two problems with it, is that the symptoms can be quite nebulous and overlap with many other medical conditions like you alluded to. And also, we don't have a diagnostic tool that we can use to say, aha, this mm -hmm. is long COVID. So oftentimes, the diagnosis right now, it comes to a matter of exclusion. You know, when we first start working with patients, we go through our general workup, take a general history, and we do diagnostics as we need to, maybe for Lyme's disease or um, cardiac inflammation. But if we don't find anything and the story fits with symptoms worsening after a COVID infection, that's when we start to think, okay, maybe this is the diagnosis of long COVID. The problem with that is that um, there may be people out there who are overdiagnosed as having long COVID and individuals out there who are under underdiagnosed mm -hmm. as long COVID. Um, and it's a trend that we're trying to figure out and solve and prevent with additional research. You know, you're an advocate for olfactory retraining for long haul patients. You say it's a way to speed things up for those who've prolonged trouble with taste and smell after an acute COVID infection. I wonder if you could explain to our audience how this training works and uh, how, did, how did you uh, alight on it? Absolutely. So the loss of taste and smell, that's something that we have all heard about during the acute infection. But for some folks, it does last for quite a bit of time, several months. And that can be quite a miserable few months. If you imagine you can't taste or smell anything, or sometimes things that normally taste and smell good taste bad. The nerves that are involved in taste and smell, they have this ability to regrow. It's called neuroplasticity, but essentially they can be regrown. And by using uh, odors to stimulate the nerves that are involved in smell, we believe that we can help them regrow properly and form the proper connections to bring back normal taste and smell. There's also some, in some additional research that using things like olfactory retraining can help rewire some of the deeper parts of the brain and actually help improve cognition. Mm -hmm. The process is pretty straightforward. We have individuals smell four different odors uh, twice a day for 30 seconds at a time. And we had them do that quite frequently for, sorry, quite a prolonged period of time, about three months. And patients will notice an effect, it's subtle, but a subtle effect of uh, getting better faster versus later. Have you uh, done, are you planning to publish on this or have you published on this? Uh, people are ahead of us on that. One thing okay. I will say is that we try to stick to only the research-driven uh, interactions Good or interventions you. here at Mayo. So that uh, comes from after seeing some similar results in the research. Mm -hmm. huh. But very important to get out into the primary care field where people may not be uh, as familiar with the literature. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's certainly a, a low risk intervention uh, for Absolutely. people. A very easy I, uh, I, I noticed another uh, piece of advice that's been attributed uh, 
to you is that long COVID patients should focus on resistance activity instead of things like walking and cycling. Uh, counterintuitive somewhat, you know, my answer to almost everything is take a brisk walk, you'll probably feel better. Uh, but in this case, you're saying they shouldn't do activities that elevate the heart rate. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So first of all, I'm a big proponent of exercise in, in healthcare. And so I, I'm never going to say the exercise is a bad thing. But because of what we see in long COVID, we think that pushing the body too hard, uh, and the too hard part is the key here, can actually make things worse. Because of long COVID and its inflammatory changes that we think underlie it, individuals with this condition, they don't have the normal uh, physical responses to activity and uh, exercise. So for example, most of us, when we start to go for a brisk walk or do some more vigorous exercise, there's that warm up period where our body adapts and it goes from being a horrible experience to being something enjoyable. Right. That change doesn't seem to happen well in individuals with long COVID. And it's kind of similar to some of the problems that we see with things like postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS. So the body is just not adapting to that. So in individuals with long COVID, if they try to push themselves too hard and just grit their teeth and exercise their way fully back to recovery in a sort of no pain, no gain attitude, their bodies just crash and they experience mm. increased inflammation. And then their symptoms get worse for hours or days. That leads them to rest and leads to further uh, deconditioning. And then they get stuck into this vicious cycle. So it's not so much about not doing activity or exercising. It's just about a slower pace to that activity. Uh, interestingly, in those folks who have conditions like postural tachycardia syndrome or things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, they are able to tolerate more recumbent resistance exercises before they can get to tolerating things like cardiovascular exercise. So that's why we have people start with things like the recumbent cycling or rowing. Once the musculature regains its strength some in tone, we think the body is better able to push around blood flow during activity, and then they're able to transition to the cardiovascular exercise. Well, that, that's good. That's great advice. You know, I uh, was heartened to hear that you are uh, evidence uh, driven in terms of your uh, work. Uh, we note that the National Institute of Health has started a research initiative to study longer term effects of COVID-19, including long COVID. And one of the leaders of the NIH recovery program is uh, Leora Horowitz from NYU Lagoon. Uh, she's been a guest on our program. And the goal here was to identify causes as well as means of prevention and treatment. I'm wondering what you could tell us about other research that you're keeping an eye on uh, or engaged in. <laughs> So, you know, I think there's two phases of research that's going on right now that are both important. One is what's really underlying the condition of long COVID on a chemical level. What is the process that's going on? We still don't understand that. Or the process that's going on for potentially similar or the same conditions like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So I'm always on the lookout for anything that can indicate, okay, there is a new inflammatory marker that may underlie some of these changes. So there has been some good research such as the genetic research that came out recently involving the uh, FOXP4, I believe it mm -hmm. was, gene, and how that may be more present and somehow related to long COVID. I think if we can get the answers to what's going on on an underlying level, that will open up a whole new doorway of therapeutics that we could use and be able to focus where our treatments are. The other thing that I'm looking out for is exactly that randomized clinical trials, right. well-designed about treatments. And right now, there's hardly anything out there um, in that level. There are some anecdotal pieces as well as some smaller observational studies that have given us some hints on things that we can use, but we're still quite lacking in this area. Yeah, and I think she has 15,000 15, people in her, in her uh, study, which is probably closer to the size that we'd like to see. Yes, exactly. exactly. For example, we have a lot of people who are wanting to use Paxlovid for the treatment of long COVID. And I've had plenty of patients with long COVID who took Paxlovid during the acute infection or even afterwards. But I'm not ready to say that Paxlovid doesn't work. What we need are some of the large numbers, like the studies that are being done by the NIH, including here at Mayo. We're uh -huh. partnering with them on that. That's the kind of information we need before we can say yay or nay. Uh, yeah. We had Dr. Uh, Ashish Jha on the show yesterday. And uh, 
uh, former uh, Biden uh, COVID czar there, if you will, and uh, now back at uh, Brown as the dean, who who I think Margaret was really pushing COVID, p- pushing Paxlovid as a, sort of a treatment for those over 50. Uh, but as you say, there's probably more data out there. As a just, preventive, no, as not a pre- for long COVID. Right. Yeah. No, as a preventive, for sure. I was yeah. just yeah. wondering about the level of financial support that you think that's out there. I'm wondering if uh, too much of... Uh, this uh, it's now in the rearview mirror is influencing the financial support that's really needed to do these very detailed uh, clinical trials. What what are you feeling or seeing out there? Yeah, this is probably my greatest fear when it comes to uh, long COVID. You know, we've had post viral conditions for the longest time sure. since all the way back to the mm-hmm. Spanish flu, even right. so influenza, Lyme disease, but. There hasn't been a lot of emphasis on this because it just hasn't been raised to a good level of awareness. When the pandemic came, that all changed. And now everyone was focused on long COVID and there was lots of support for research and such. But these things take time. The pandemic's behind us. We're seeing less numbers of long COVID, but it's not going away. So I am worried that the financial support is going to run out uh, behind trying to figure out these really serious conditions that are affecting millions of people out there. But Fortunately, by having discussions like we are right now, we can keep this on the forefront yeah. and keep the science moving are, forward. Are you yeah, seeing Dr. anything ben, maybe internationally? Uh, you know, we've been keeping an eye on uh, the UK and o- other places uh, anywhere that you and your team are, are looking at for if it's not happening in the States where, where other people are taking a leadership role here. Mm-hmm. I would say the UK has been really paramount in <clears throat> a lot of the early research, and we do have some connections there as well through Mayo Clinic. And so if we were to, to branch out across the world, which we hope to do, uh, that would be my number one choice. We've mm-hmm. also had some good success working with our folks down in Australia. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Dr. Van, the uh, concern uh, among so many others is around health disparities also with uh, with long COVID. And, you know, maybe you could uh, comment on this as a, a starting point of uh, health inequity and health disparities, inflammatory diseases, chronic illnesses, disparities in access to health care. Based on what you're seeing, do people present differently based on uh, factors like race and ethnicity as well as age? We're hearing young women may be more likely affected, which you know is not as uh, you know maybe as uh, apparent to some. Tell, tell us about that and how do we how do we address that? Part of it is the research and making sure those studies are large enough, obviously, like the uh, All of Us project nationally. But could you comment on that a bit? Yeah, thank you so much for asking about that. I think that's something that's really quite overlooked, this disparity part about long COVID, something I'm really passionate about. You know, long COVID affects everybody across the population, right? We, this got to be the case. Here at Mayo Clinic, what we have noticed is that certain individuals are able to access care uh, to for long COVID, and that's the same across other institutions. A person that typically can go to a specialty clinic for long COVID, they've got support for things like well, financial support, paid time off, long-term disability through an employer, all those kinds of means for travel and such. That's not something that's available across the board to all individuals. For example, we have not seen in the research or in our clinical practice individuals who work more on the forefront of uh, our industries let's say uh, farmers or agricultural workers or line workers from automotive factory, we know those individuals are, must be out there in suffering symptoms, but we're not seeing them get care. Uh, health disparities, of course, they existed long before COVID came around, but right. if anything, the pandemic and the long COVID phenomenon has exacerbated that disparity. So we are actively working with some of our local groups, uh, community engagement boards and so forth to see if we can improve that uh, reach out and improve that disparity. One area that we are particularly uh, worried about are individuals who are already living with disabilities. It's very difficult for them to uh, get care already. Right. How are they doing now if they have long COVID? You know, in the, in the category of insult to injury, uh, there are skeptics out there about long COVID, and you've been mm-hmm. concerned that patients can be stigmatized and not believed. I'm wondering if you could share your insights uh, you have on blaming the victim situation. You know, medicine, 
providers of medicine and medicine in general, it's an area where the unknown is not willingly accepted, the mysterious, right? And when someone doesn't know what something is, it's easy to just sort of chalk it out to something else mm -hmm. for a quick answer. So a lot of people who were presenting with these symptoms early on, providers didn't know what to make of it. They never had heard about these kinds of long-term issues. So they reached for whatever they could find was the most common explanation and seemed the most similar. And that often resulted in diagnoses of anxiety and depression. And what I remind folks uh, out there, other providers who are trying to tackle this issue is that, okay, let's just say devil's advocate that this condition is all related to some sort of psychiatric fallout from COVID. Well, those people, if they have that condition, they need our care as well, too. And I remind individuals that the care for patients with long COVID is typically not that much different than how we would treat a patient if they didn't have long COVID. So, for example, if they have anxiety, we would use the same tools. If they have a headache, we would use the same tools. There's only some subtle differences that need to be acknowledged, such as the pacing piece. So if we can get people more comfortable in accepting this condition and just treating the patient and their symptoms versus, oh, is it long COVID? Is it not long COVID? Is it not real? Or is it real? Or is it just in the brain? These people, in the end, all they need is our help. And that's what I'm mindful. Well, I also think it, it strikes an important chord for us in the, in the context of team-based care, right? Because you really need to bring on all the disciplines, certainly the behavioral health uh, special professionals along with the with the medical clinical team as well, and and obviously occupational therapy and a whole range of people uh, in terms of the uh, approach that really needs to be taken for uh, people who have uh, uh, long COVID. And I would I would just add in you asked about the stigma, and that is definitely a part of long COVID. Um, there's a stigma for patients who get this diagnosis. I would say there's also a little bit of a stigma for providers who give the diagnosis as well, too. So all the way around, it can be a very difficult situation for people to understand. Dr. Van, uh, you obviously uh, are expert in this area, have so much to offer, and you pointed out that you're seeing the people who get to you, but hard to know who all you're missing, but no knowing that you're missing certain groups of people just by the populations that surround you. I wonder what your take is on uh, what's the force multiplier here to get this knowledge out. We have in across the country, we have, you know, 1300 community health centers with 12,000 sites take care of 30 million people. We have the veteran affairs, we have primary care associations, but it seems like we need a systematic way to get this knowledge out uh, to everybody. You're probably familiar with Project ECHO that originated in New Mexico. We've run uh, Project ECHOs. Have you given thought to this? Have, or are you participating in any initiatives like that to try and really disseminate this knowledge? Yes, absolutely. So um, interestingly enough, I started my career as a primary care doctor. And so uh, enabling the primary care community to help individuals with long COVID has always been a long-term goal uh, of mine. And we are working on several initiatives and strategies to help bolster uh, the primary care community in this area. So for example, I work very closely with a think group at the Minnesota Department of Health. And the sole purpose of that group is to develop tools for primary care practices, um, uh, public health centers across the country to have better access to uh, important knowledge and tools used for the treatment of long COVID. Uh, we have often already done uh, several uh, ongoing education seminars about long COVID. Uh, those are the first things that we did, but we find that what providers really, really need is something that they can access right then when the patient is right in front of them in their right. busy schedule right. with somebody every 15 minutes. And so having things like the tools that we're developing with the Minnesota Department of Health, I think that would be helpful. Frankly speaking, another thing that's been really good is uh, telehealth. Yep. Uh, during the pandemic, well, a lot of the regulations and limitations for, pan for uh, telehealth went down, and we were able to help patients from all across the country. And that's not the case at this point. So I do think that there could be a network of uh, long COVID experts that would be available across the country if we we're able to make some headway in that kind of area. Well, let me pull the thread on that theme of access, because I, I think particularly focusing on the work and the, the great work that Mayo Clinic does, because people often hear Mayo Clinic and they think they need to hop on a plane to get to Rochester, Minnesota, but that's not really the case. Uh, and what kind of long COVID uh, patients can be treated 
close to their home. I, I know here in Connecticut, we're a statewide practice, but in one of our counties, Middlesex uh, Health, there's a strong partnership with Mayo Clinic and also Cleveland Clinic and others have similar types of network. Uh, is that sort of one of the, the ways that people should uh, understand that they can uh, access some of the best and brightest minds locally? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so again, we use telehealth quite a bit to interact with patients from all across the U.S. during the early parts of the pandemic. And right now, we don't try to foster a model where we just bring everybody to Mayo Clinic to get their ongoing care. Long COVID, as the name suggests, can sometimes last for several months and need ongoing treatment. So something that we always ask our patients about is their support in their local community, where they have a primary care provider. These are physical therapy practice that they can work with. And so we try to provide the guidance and, and treatment um, uh, interventions that patients can use in their local community and stay there. We think that's going to be best for the patients and will respect their finances as much as possible and also empower their local community for that next patient. And again, it's more difficult now. Um, now we have to be licensed in that state to see a new patient from the state. So because of that, my colleagues and I, we are getting a lot more medical licenses done so we can reach out more. Yeah, that's been that's been challenging across the country. You know, I, I know our time is uh, drawing uh, to a close, but I, I did want to ask about one uh, essential element of care. I think that you described and that's uh, what what can we do within the behavioral health community? Mm -hmm. I think you've uh, talked about using cognitive behavioral therapy in your practice there. Maybe tell us a little bit about for people who aren't familiar with it, what underlies uh, CBT as we refer to it that is helpful in this scenario? No, there is all sorts of emotions when it comes to being ill. And then when you throw in something like COVID that uprooted our entire lives and crossed over political boundaries and such and divided things along that axis, this is a very traumatic experience for a lot of individuals. And so when I see individuals who've experienced long COVID, Sometimes they've been told some very terrible things and have been shunned to the side by families and friends. There can be a lot of underlying emotion and damage that's done by the time they see me. Part of the process of healing from long COVID is definitely the physical side. And most people wanna focus on that when they see us. But I'll have to remind patients that both the mind and body work together and we have to address both in order for them to get better. Sometimes that's as simple as treating anxiety and depression with medications, but oftentimes it relies and really exploring what a person is feeling and the reasons behind that. So I've found uh, using skills in like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy to be very helpful in talking to my patients about this. Sometimes the only intervention we do is just talking with them and helping them uh, reframe their condition and how they're going to progress through it. Thank you so much, Dr. Dan, for joining us today, for your insights, for your pioneering work. Thank you to our audience for joining us as well. There's more online about conversations on healthcare, including a way to sign up for email updates. Our address is chcradio.com. Again, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. All righty, take care. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.